Everybody needs to write uh, an evaluation for the class about the same as last semester. It is due next Monday. We have class on Monday, Yumi. Okay, next Monday a makeup class because there's no class on Wednesday. And I, you told me about the Wednesday holiday, but I forgot and I thought, oh dear. So we're having class on Monday. The final will be on Wednesday right after that. And you know that. And in your evaluation, you need to provide a summary of your notes. You can use a lot of copy and paste, it's fine with me. The jinghua of your notes. You can put it all together in a big file, put it in a big word file, and then PDF it, make it into PDF. And send it again to, to Gmail, feather, uh, feathermountain at gmail.com. So that's a summary of all your notes for this semester. Everything important, if there's a lot of repetition, you can edit that out you think it's not that important, or maybe it got corrected later, you can correct it or edit it out, whatever. So, summary of your notes for the semester into a Word file, PDF it. Then PDF, send me the PDF to Feather Mountain. Then a summary, not a summary, then an evaluation of the class. First of all, the class itself, um, what was good about it, what should be improved, what could be added, what could be omitted next time, whatever it is, your hopefully as objective as possible opinion and uh, evaluation of the class, including the textbook, including the jin du, including the shangke de fang shi, the OCW, um, the tests, the exercises, the discussions, the corrections, everything. So what you think of that. Number two is evaluate yourself. This is to remind you what we did last semester. Evaluate yourself, how much effort you put into the class, whether you missed class, were late, were late with assignments, or whether you were pretty good about being on time and handing in your assignments on time, asking questions when something wasn't clear, how much time you put into the class outside of class, all that stuff. So your evaluation of yourself, what you got out of the class, how much you put into it. And then part three is how you're going to continue in English, phonetics, linguistics, whatever applies in your case. So your plan for continuing to improve your English, that's the main purpose of it. Some of you, I expect, will go on in linguistics because people who hang on this long, you have to be pretty tough to make it through second semester of phonetics. That means you may be interested enough to maybe do graduate school in some kind of area, some area of linguistics. So how you're going to continue in linguistics or phonetics. The most important thing is how you're going to continue to improve your English and your languages, not just English. Okay, so that's part three. And that also is to be PDF'd and sent to Feather Mountain. So that's two separate files. One is the summary of your notes, including your pronunciation plan, Jindu and stuff like that. You can do like a final summary of your pronunciation improvement. What things you wanted to fix, which things you fixed, which things you still are working on, which things you have in mind for the future, whatever. So a summary of your pronunciation plan, pronunciation plan, and summary of class notes. Bella, anything? No, I'm just thinking, can you like, allow us to attend this a week later? Because with the graduation ceremony. Yes, that's OK. Actually, a week later is fine. A week later is fine. Yeah. OK? Any questions about either of those? Evaluation in three parts plus class note summary. All clear? Good. That's the first thing. The second thing is, can you please hand in your notes from the past week? Now, this is going to be a race against time. Everybody knows, because we've only just started Chapter 9. That means we have today for chapter 9, we have next Monday for chapter 10. And then it's the final exam. That's it. That's the end of the class. So it's going to be very rushed. You will have to read it, both the chapters yourself. We're going to do what we can in class, but you are responsible. Put it down. You are responsible for reading both chapters because we're going to just jump a lot, grab a few important things and summarize. The rest is up to you. But I'm not that uneasy about it because the hard part, as we all know, 
and you've known since the beginning of first semester is chapter eight. It wasn't that hard after all, but it's because we did it step by step. We took our time on it. If we had to really rush through it as fast as it is in the textbook and rush through things like the paragraphs that were mentioned, that were omitted from the textbook, we would have had a harder time. But as things stand, I think everybody has a fairly good understanding of acoustic phonetics as presented in chapter eight. The decibels was extra. Some of you got more, some of you less out of that. If you want to work more on that yourself, yourself it's fine. If not, it's okay too. But as for chapter eight with latifoged, my feeling, my gut feeling is everybody's pretty much on the same page. We're okay with that. Is that right? You have that feeling too? Chapter eight, we're okay? Okay, so that's what I was most concerned about. Chapter nine and 10 are important. However, there's a lot of material in nine and 10 that we've actually covered before, both in the textbook and in class. So when it comes to parts that we're already sort of familiar with, we're gonna kind of rush through them. The next thing is vowels and consonants is due today. It's your very final, final assignment for vowels and consonants. Anybody have any questions? Any questions quickly, because our time is truly short. So today, no fumbling around, please. Any questions on vowels and consonants? If you don't have questions, just say no questions and we're going to move on. No questions? Yeah, shaking your head actually helps. Jerome, you have any questions? No? You me? Okay, then that's it. Hand in your work, please. I even brought the book today. Another thing is I plan the final exam to take one hour. And I also want to use the day of our final exam for an additional activity. I have, Tina made it, good. Miranda, will you bring Tina up to date on everything? Yes. Tell her the stuff she missed. I have a French friend who is interested in the same kinds of world music as I am. We both like really unusual world music. And he actually went to Mongolia to learn throat singing. And you've heard some of it, we talked about it in class before. So, the day of the final exam, I've asked my friend, his name is Victor, Victor Thibault, he's going to come to class and demonstrate. Oh. Isn't that something? He said yes, he's leaving for France very soon. He's going to France to, take a, to do an MA in translation. So he's still here for a few more weeks. And he said he'd be happy to come. And he'll show you another kind of interesting demonstration. So um, I think we'll do that before the exam. There would be less pressure if we do it after, but I'm afraid people will be writing and writing and writing and then filling up the time that's available. So if we start a little later, your available time will be less, but you'll have to finish on time anyway. <laughs> Okay, so I told him he only needs to talk for about 20 minutes. So for the first 20 minutes of our final exam, we're going to have a guest. And I also have a web page I want to share with you. It's got too much material for the time available, but I'll show you some of it, just using what we have available. So everybody's informed on that. So class next Monday, we have a makeup class on Monday. Wednesday is the final exam, but for the first half hour or so, we'll be doing a web page plus my friend Vic Dole's demonstration. Okay, all clear, good. That's it. Uh, one more thing is you do not have to do the written exercises for chapter nine. You don't have to do the written exercises for chapter nine. We may or may not have time for the oral exercises. For nine and 10, I mainly just wanna get through the main points. And that's it, that's everything on my list. If you have any missing homework, make sure that you hand it in no later than next Monday. If you have any missing homework, I'm Mendy, Sophie, is anybody missing any homework? Okay, Mendy? Sorry? All right, so if you're not sure, go to Mendy and she will tell you. And if you are sure, then tell Mendy that oh, I'm going to hand it in next Monday. <laughs> okay? We're going to chapter nine. Now, I asked you to read up to Page 226, right? Yourself? Everybody sort of remember that? And you can also listen to the files on the CD. So we're just going to skip over that. We mentioned pretty much the idea of, what's our main topic so far? Cardinal vowels and two kinds. First, primary and secondary, and why are they in that order? Why are the primary cardinal vowels primary? All right, 
Primary, secondary, I'm uh, sorry, primary cardinal vowels are primary because why? Yeah, that's a good enough answer. They're more common in human languages. There's an acoustic reason why, well, what is the main difference? It's which vowels are rounded, right? In primary vowels, which vowels are rounded? The back vowels. And in secondary, it's the reverse. Why is it so common for languages to have rounded back vowels? Exactly. We're able to add more contrast between vowels because there's less space in the back of the mouth. There's less space for contrast. So we can add space by jia gai yang tai, right? We can add space with our lips. With lip rounding, we can push down the formants, especially three, um, we can, and two. We can push down the formants, we can create more, we can create more contrast with rounding. Okay, and secondary cardinal vowels have rounded front vowels. Those vowels are more marked, M-A-R-K-E-D, marked, 有标记. That means they're not so uncommon, but they are marked. They're not the expected vowel. They're more unusual. And it also takes more effort to jump back and forth because there are fewer front rounded vowels. If you are working with both rounded and unrounded front vowels together, it takes a lot of effort to go from e to u and back to e. You notice that a lot of people will say things like ji xu or ji xi. Ji xu, ji xu. It takes a lot of effort to get the rounding right for each one. So, Actually, rounded vowels are more marked, and I, my experience is in languages that have some front rounded vowels, you really have to slow down and make sure that you're rounding in the right place, or you will have core articulation effects that you don't want. We're going to go on to, actually, let's just look very quickly at 224. Vowels and other accents of English. Um, it says that about New, Z New Zealand English, which is similar to what? We're in the first paragraph on 224. Some forms of New Zealand English. The vowel in sax is similar to the American English and sax, and that will get really confusing, won't it? When you're talking about sex, you're actually talking about sax. What a disappointment, okay. Um, or actually, if you're actually talking about sex, and they think it's about sex, but it's not so spicy. So we'll find movements of vowels. They will be shifted um, from dialect to the dialect. And as we mentioned last semester, uh, English dialects differ from each other most in vowels. That's right. OK. Um, the rest, I think you can handle yourself. It says another change is going on in northern cities in the United States, such as Pittsburgh and Detroit. This is the fourth paragraph on 224. Um, in this accent, a has been raised, and format one has been decreased, so that it is very close to a. That's also very similar to what they're describing for New Zealand. The back vowels have a lower second formant, making them all farther back than in Californian English. This accent does distinguish a and o. So this is my part of the country in the U.S. And among other accents of English, consider the vowels of 9.8, which are the mean of a group of BBC English speakers. The main feature to be noted here is the distinction between the back vowels, a uh, and father, caught, and in bother, caught, o. Oh. Okay. And o oh is an author and caught. And note that a uh, has a very low position in comparison with most forms of American English. We covered that last semester. So cup, cop, American cup, British cop. That takes care of that. For other languages, first of all, Spanish. Spanish has only five vowels. There are allophones, however. Although it's a, a, e, o, u in Spanish, in different contexts, the vowels will still be affected by context. So they were, there will still be allophones. However, if you are a Spanish speaker, very often, what do you think is going to happen to American E and I? Probably they're going to go for E, which is what often happens, in a, especially in a stereotyped Spanish 
accent. For example, this is a book, things like that. All right, uh, Japanese also has a, i, u, e, o. However, they're u. What about the, the u in Japanese? It's not u, actually. It's u, u. It's got lip spreading, so it's the same set. However, u is u, udon, for example, udon. Okay. Mm and then Danish, if Danish culture in general has said by some people to be rather boring. Okay, pardon the Danes. Okay, my, my Danes, please pardon me. It's just kind of a dull Western country. But I have to say that, oh, the language also, that the language is kind of boring. It's just another Western European language, another Scandinavian language. But their vowels are really, really interesting. So if you want to look into some, an interesting vowel system, you can look into Danish. Okay, as we mentioned, Ladefogel's name in Danish is Ladefogel or something like that. They've got an unusual, they've got a pharyngeal approximant for R, um, as you can see. Um, the rest I think you can look through yourself. You're going to find front rounded vowels. Um, okay, and on page 228, what we were just talking about. Why are there fewer front rounded vowels and back unrounded vowels? Oh, and we have to mention minayu. For example, uh, another way of pronouncing zu ro de zu we talked about last semester is besides du, there's also some people say di, and then there's a third way to do it. Du, du. That's a very high back unrounded vowel. So, Sophie, don't you have that where you're from? The sound th, right? Can you demonstrate for us? There we go. Okay. For example, zu ro. Okay. Th, th. All right. So you have it in some varieties of minai, including Sophie's. Mm. And the details on it are on page 228, paragraph 3, the second entire paragraph. And. They're talking about which formants are affected by um, changing what. Um, so you have a few new symbols to learn. Uh, let's go to the vowel chart. These are standardized vowels. These are basically the cardinal vowels. So let's just make sure that we know what everything on the chart represents. Let's start from the upper left hand corner. That's our extreme high front vowel. Okay, everybody E. e. And then e. e. I'm not making them totally cardinal because usually vowels in languages are not cardinal vowels. I'm going to kind of make them so, uh, a little less extreme. So E and U, no problem. We've got them in Mandarin. Below that, we've got I, which we know from American. And then we've got the rounded equivalent, which would be what? You can figure it out. I. U, U. So it's not quite so high as U, U, U. It's lower than U. Then we go to A, which we have in Spanish. And then if we round it, A, U. Good. Then we've got um, E. Let's round that. E, U. So we've got U and then U. Try to contrast the higher U with the, with the lower U. Try. Uh, 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 uh. All right. Unless you hear them together, it's going to be hard for most of us to distinguish. Below that, we've got a eh from American, a. Eh. And then if we go down lower, we've got the your mouth the a, which is like the first pound, first part of I and ao, or it's like an chan the an Having it in Mandarin makes it really easy to find. An a. Uh, Let's round that. Uh, uh, all right. Then we'll go back. Uh, uh, and then a bit rounded, we get the British pot vowel. Oh, not too much. Then we go up to uh, uh, no problem. But it's more ah uh in British. And then the one that's put together with it, which isn't exactly at the same level, but they just do this for convenience. So, the, the, in American, it's aw, aw, but in British, aw, aw, port, port, more aw, 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 cold, souls. Then above that, we have 
Oh, not the diphthong, just the monophthong. Oh, now let's unround it. Oh, uh. We're getting close to du zi uh the uh, because that's the symbol we use. Du zi uh, 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 in a more Beijing accent. Above that, we have uh, uh, and we've got, we've got a schwa at the end. We've got an off glide in American English. But if it were more pure, it would be more like um, uh, uh, uh. All right, higher, we've got ooh. Let's unround it. Ooh, ooh. Good. Let's go to the middle now. Let's go to the very middle, which is a schwa. Uh, uh. Now that's a very useful vowel, although remember that many languages do not use schwas. They don't use a schwa to replace a main vowel in an unaccented syllable, like Georgian. I, had, I learned the hard way, sort of. Okay, and then let's go way up to the top. We're going back between E and U. Let's do an unrounded vowel. That's the E with a bar through it. So between E and U go to the middle. And that's something like uh, uh. And that's like zi liao de zi. We use that vowel often. We often borrow this. It's not perfect, but it's close enough. Zi liao de zi. We use the barred I. And then let's round it. Uh, uh, uh. I'm getting a little friction myself. And then let's go down to a little above the schwa. Uh, uh. All right. Uh, and then round it. Uh, uh. Go down below that, we get an equivalent to e, eh, but it's more central. E, eh, e, uh, uh, and e. Uh. Down a little lower, no rounding. E, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And we've covered the vowels. Okay, good enough. Mm. We're going to move on to a few other features you need to know about because they come up in linguistic studies very often. First of all, is ATR, advanced tongue root. And there's often some kind of controversy about what this exactly is. There are certain languages that we're sure have something called advanced tongue root. But sometimes people try to apply it, for example, to English to account for tense vowels. So E, people might say, has advanced tongue root. But that, according to what I've read, is not an appropriate use of it. Um, let's just go through this part. Differences in vowel quality can usually be described in terms of variations in the degrees of height, backness, and lip rounding. But in some languages, there are differences in vowel quality that cannot be described in these terms. For example, in Akan. And that's the language that is almost always cited with ATR, Akan. You can, it's worth remembering. It's a West African language, a language spoken in Ghana. And when I went to a conference in Slovakia, in uh, Košice in Slovakia, I was using the computer and met an African guy who spoke Akan. I, sp I said, you spoke Akan, you speak Akan. Wow, so you have advanced tongue root. He said, yes, and I'll show you what it is. <laughs> so I got first -hand, uh, a first-hand demonstration of advanced tongue root in Akan. It was very interesting. And he was writing a lot about it himself in his own linguistic work. Um, so there are two sets of vowels you can hear on the CD. They differ primarily in the size of the pharynx. So yin. In one set, there are vowels in which the root of the tongue is drawn forward and the larynx is lowered. So you push your pharynx forward and you push your larynx down. That's how ATR works. And let's see if we can get a sample of it here. Try to fight it. Mm. No, we got something. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah. One big. Set. Okay. So, in some of them, you may have been able to hear kind of tightness. And that's about how ATR sounds. Well, if you hear a uh, kind of, that's why people have tended to associate it with, um, with tense vowels. But it's something special that they do. They push their pharynx forward, their larynx down. They have a kind of tightness that changes the quality of the vowel. Um, 
Okay, these vowels are called advanced tongue root or more simply plus ATR vowels. In the other set, there are vowels in which there is no advancement of the tongue root or lowering of the larynx. So we write that as minus ATR. And we have the symbol here, which is what? What is the symbol for ATR? Okay, usually we just write plus or minus ATR, and then it says it's comparison, in comparison with the minus ATR vowel, they symbolize it with just a plain. What is it? Yeah, okay. So that's advanced, it means advanced. Um, not all speakers of Akan make a distinction between the two vowels, but the one I ran into did. So it's very real. It's not something somebody um, made up. And some seem to rely more on movements of the root of the tongue and others on differences in larynx height. What matters for the distinction between the two sets of vowels is that one should have a comparatively large pharyngeal cavity and the other a comparatively small one. So that's ATR. That may be in the test. ATR is kind of a big deal. You'll see it in the literature a lot. And we don't distinguish vowels through ATR in English. Although tongue root position does vary to some extent in conjunction with vowel height, the tense high vowels, e and u, as in heed and hood, have a more advanced tongue root than the lax mid high vowels, i and u, as in hid and hood. However, the distinction between plus and minus ATR vowels is not the same as the distinction between these two kinds of vowels, tense and lax, in English. Okay? And we also have phonological distinctions between vowels like e and i, for example. The end of the paragraph on 229 before rhoticized vowels, or rhoticized. The other way we distinguish, distinguish e and i is phonologically, for example, i cannot occur in an open syllable. However, I had a little discussion on this with somebody. Remember that that vowel training software that some of you tried out? I had a discussion with the person who designed the software. They use, they give you vowels in syllables like b and d. They give you syllables like that. And I said, I don't think that that's a good idea because we don't have syllables like that in English. Well, actually we do. We have syllables like that, but not ones that end with a short vowel. So we have didn't. We can divide it that way, didn't. So actually, it's not completely accurate to say that we do not, or that short vowels do not occur in open syllables. Actually, they do when they're within a word, but they don't occur at the end of a word. So you should write that down. That's an important difference. And I know that very well in trying to train my students in English pronunciation. When you're dividing a word up into syllables, you often do have a short vowel just sitting there at the end of a syllable because that's the way we speak, didn't, little, li, there we go, we've got lots of them. But we don't put them at the end of a word. So basically I think it should be, they aren't word final. They do actually occur in syllables. All right, R rhoticized vowels, so that's ATR. That wasn't a really clear presentation. We didn't have a lot of time to fuss with the file, but you can do that on your own. Listen to them yourself, please put that in your notes. Listen to the files yourself. It really was not satisfactory and I'm wasn't going to try and push the matter here. So ATR, plus or minus, in Akan. Listen to the difference yourself. Next is rhoticized vowels. And we have them in American English. They also have them in Irish English and various other dialects. And we notice that R coloring can be produced in more than one way. What are the two ways? Like I said, a lot of this is repeated material. The two ways basically are? Curling up your tongue, which is retroflexion. So when you say zhuanshe and retroflex, remember that you're talking about that kind of erhua. A lot of people don't. I don't, usually. I can, but I don't. When I do it is in Chinese, because that's the way I learn Chinese. So erzi, for erzi, I do curl up. But the vowel is also different. In, in Taiwan, you say erzi, or you say erzi, even without the R. So erzi, or erzi. In Beijinghua, it's more like arzi. You can hear the vowel is more like ah than uh. Try it yourself. 
儿子，儿子。You know, if you really curl it up, it pushes your tongue down, so you end up with an ah sound. 儿子，儿子。If you really want to make it round, that's my experience. Do you find that yourself or not? 有没有 ？No, Vivian. Try. Uh huh. Your vowel changed. Can the rest of you hear it? Yeah. It wasn't as ah as mine, but it did change. So when you retroflex, it's going to affect the vowel. They're not exactly the same, in my experience. So,、um, yeah, keep that in mind. That although they say that bunching your tongue and curling the tip of your tongue and using retroflex produce the same effect, they do not. They do not. They have different effects on the vowel. So you can't really do something different articulatorily. And expect the outcome to be exactly the same. It's hard for it to be exactly the same. It may be close enough that people don't mind, and that's what happens with R. It's close enough that people don't care. It doesn't make any difference. But for me, there is a difference. For R,、er, your, your tongue tends for R,、er, your tongue will be pushed down further.、Um, Rhoticization is an auditory quality, which, like height and backness, is most appropriately defined in acoustic terms. We, lear we, we learned that last semester. Does everybody remember? We don't define R's usually articulatorily. We mainly define them auditorily or acoustically, because you can do different things with your tongue to produce what we will accept as an R. So it's mainly an auditory quality, and that's the main thing. And we know that F3 goes down for or hua for rhoticization.、Mm. All right, and the other thing is to remember that for the schwa plus er, the er starts right at the beginning of the schwa. So er, for example,、um, erstwhile. That's a very unusual word, but erst, erstwhile, erstwhile.、Um, that has er right from the beginning, but for the other vowels, a, or o, or u, or ur, whatever it is, the vowel. Starts out as a plain vowel and then it gets rhoticized around the middle. We had all that last semester. Nasalization. Remember that nasalization in Chinese is called bi hua, and bi hua means that it's basically a sound that should be produced orally, but you are allowing some air to go out through your nose. So basically, it's an oral sound with added nasalization. It is not n, m, ng. Those sounds we don't call nasalization. Those are just nasals. And we also mentioned that last semester. And we have nasalization. I would divide it into two kinds. One is the kind that affects meaning, and the other is the kind that doesn't. So in some languages, it's phonemic; in other languages, it is not. In English, you find nasalization all over the place. Some people have very anasal voices; they have very little nasalization at all. It sounds like they have a cold. It's a much drier kind of voice. I have to force myself. It's not very natural. And some people have way too much nasalization. Some people are in between. I have a lot of nasalization, but it's not a nasalized voice. I mean, I don't have a basically purely nasal voice. It's just mainly my dialect. We have a lot of allophonic nasalization. If a nasal is coming up, I start nasalizing on the vowel quite early. Different dialects have different time schedules for when they start nasalizing an upcoming nasal consonant. And then we have a whole series of nasalized vowels here. They want you to practice.、Um, I don't think it'll be a problem here, but let's just do some of them. Everybody, ah, 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 ah. ah. e, 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 e. 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 a, 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 a. o, o, o. o. All right. So. What are some languages besides Minayu that exploit nasalization phonemically? French and another famous Western European language, Portuguese. Portuguese, yeah. So French and Portuguese are the ones I think most people will think of first. For Taiwan, we'll think of Minayu. But there's plenty of nasalization in Mandarin as well, just like we were talking about before with the Wanyi. That's nasalization. The tongue doesn't touch one e when we say Wanyi. We've got a nasalized vowel, but is that phonemic or allophonic? It's allophonic. That's allophonic. Okay. We can also nasalize other consonants. It doesn't have to be a vowel. For example, 
you can nasalize L. So, L. Everybody, L. Uh huh. You can nasalize R. 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 <laughs> Sounds like you're telling a joke or angry or something, or something scary is happening. You can nasalize Y. 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 <laughs> Sounds like a villain in a cartoon. And W also. Everybody, W. So you can nasalize all kinds of sounds, not just vowels. Summary of vowel quality. Um, table 9.2 summarizes the discussion of vowels. Let's, who's our next reader? It looks like the camera is pointing right at Miranda. Let's, let's have Miranda, just because the camera is ready. OK? Read table 9.2, the features of vowel quality. The, quality, first, the first quality is, uh-huh, and its correlates are? Frequency of formant one. Good, keep going. Backness, mm -hmm. difference between frequencies of uh, formant two and formant one. Now, you can just say formant two. Formant two is not that good. It doesn't match as well as height and formant one match. It's not as good, but there is a correlation. One way they try to improve the correlation is to subtract the frequency of formula one, which will be lower or higher than, than, than formant two. Formant one will be higher or lower than formant two? <coughs> lower, right. So if we subtract formant one from formant two, that in theory brings it a little more in step with backness. That makes it a bit of a better reflection of backness, but it's still not perfect. And they have wavered in different editions of the book. Sometimes they say just F2 is fine. In other editions, they say subtract F1 from F2. You find both shuofadangoshuofadoyo. The results do not come out very, very differently. The thing is that backness is reflected mainly in formant two. You can improve, you can improve the accuracy by subtracting formant one from formant two, but no matter what, the correlation between backness and F2 is not as good as the correlation between height and F1. Okay? It sounds like a test question. Not saying for sure, but I'm just saying it sounds like one. Keep going, Miranda. Rotization. Uh -huh. I would say rotization because I usually say I instead of I. Rotization. Uh -huh. Frequency of formant three. All right, there's a pretty good correlation between rotization and formant three. And keep going. Rounding, mm -hmm. lip position. Right, and rounding is also reflected mainly in which format? In three and also two, mainly in F3, but also in F2. Keep going. ATR, width of the pharynx. Width of the pharynx, right, how wide the pharynx is. And is it wider or narrower in ATR? Let's go back. Which is it? They make it wider, stretch it out, okay? And then? Nasalization. And again, I'd say nasalization. Nasalization. Right? Position of the soft palate. That means if it is down, letting air through the um, nasal cavity, or if it is up and making all the air come out through the oral cavity. So that's the summary of vowel quality. We're going on to semi-vowels. Without being too precise about the meaning of the term syllable and syllabic, a matter which we will discuss in, ne in the next chapter, we can say that all sounds function either as the peaks of syllables or at the syllable margins. So all sounds function either as the peaks of syllables or at the syllable margins. Why did he say it in such a roundabout way? What is he really talking about? Things that we conventionally talk about how? Wendy? Louder? <coughs> coda and onset. Coda and onset. Oh, you had a false tap. Coda and coda and. Uh huh. Yeah, he is. But that's what he, you can give it different names. But he's talking about another very basic conventional idea that we usually say in other terms. Syllabicity. It's not really what he's talking about here. He's saying that. All sounds, here he's talking about segments. He's talking about segments here. Segments means what? Either a, what's a segment? Either a, louder? 
either a vowel or a consonant. A segment is the, an aggr aggregate term for vowels and consonants. Together we call them segments. So segments includes vowels and consonants. So when he's talking about, we have sounds that are usually, that are either the peak of a syllable or at the margin of the syllable. What is he thinking of here? If you read a, f a bit on, further on, you can find out where he's going with this. What kind of sounds do we usually find in the peak of a syllable? Vowels, that's right. And at the margins, we usually find consonants. However, we're finding that things are not as clear cut, they're not as cut and dried as we sometimes like to imagine. Because, for example, we've got, we found what we could nasalize woo, right? Mm. So that means it behaves sort of like a vowel, right? So what he's saying is that um, some consonants like l and n and n can be syllabic in words like shuttle in British more than American, and then but n, that one for me is syllabic. So consonants can also in some cases be syllabic. So it seems like they're behaving more like a vowel in those cases. And we can also divide sounds into those that have no obstruction in the center of the mouth, which he's going to call, here's a new word, vocoids. And this sounds like it's from a science fiction novel, mm -hmm. vocoids. It's sounds that behave like vowels but are not necessarily vowels, includes sounds that are not necessarily vowels. So vocoids includes all the vowels, plus additional sounds that behave something like vowels. In syllabicity, for example, they can be a syllabic consonant, like n or u. And those that have an obstruction. So, 如果那个口腔里有受到阻碍,那就不是vocoid. This latter group, which will include most consonants, may be called, fourth line from the bottom? Huh? Fourth line from the bottom? Fourth line, fourth line, count. <laughs> Non-vocoids, that's right. So vo vocoids are vowels plus consonants that seem to behave a lot like vowels. And the ones that are left will have an obstruction in the mouth. Those are called non-vocoids. And that gives a pair of divisions that we can arrange as shown in figure 9.13. So look on 233, and then you will see that we've got vocoids in the middle as opposed to non-vocoids. Then we've got sounds that can be syllabic, like l and n are sometimes syllabic, right? Those can be considered vocoids. And then we've got sounds that are not syllab syllabic, and those are not considered vocoids, okay, if they're not syllabic. Um, given this division, we can define vowels as syllabic vocoids and semi-vowels as non-syllabic vocoids. So vocoids, I said that vocoids can't be non-syllabic, but they can. This is, this is how we're defining it. In fact, if it's a semi-vowel, it can be at the, it's usually at the margin of a syllable, but it still is like a vowel. So yi and wu, they still are a lot like a vowel, but they are at the edge of a syllable. So in this case, we can call them a non-syllabic vocoid. That's a non-syllabic vocoid. So we've got the non-syllabic part here. Some of them are vocoids, namely the semi-vowels. That's what he's working up to. Um, the term semi-consonant is sometimes used for syllabic non-vocoids, but these are usually called semi-vowels. We will refer to them simply as syllabic consonants. So, we're going to call them syllabic consonants, like l and n. Similarly, non-vocoids are sometimes called true consonants, a term that could be applicable whether they are syllabic or not. So let's just go through it to make sure we've got the whole thing. Vocoids is a big category that includes vowels plus a number of other sounds that sometimes, at least sometimes, behave like vowels. So for example, vocoids can include syllabic consonants like n and l, n and l, those are considered vocoids when they are syllabic consonants. And, and it can also 
includes some things that are not syllabic, non-syllabic, namely, bottom of 232, semi-vowels which are ban yuan yin, ban mu yin, or we've been calling, we've mainly been using approximants for, for ye and wu and ru and le. So it includes ye and wu, which are called semi-vowels, normally semi-vowels, ban yuan yin or ban mu yin in Chinese. They are not syllabic. They occur at the edge of a syllable, but they are still a lot like a vowel. So those are called semi-vowels. All clear? And vocoids is also including syllabic consonants. All right, and syllabic consonants has, an, uh, has a name that's sometimes used, namely semi-consonant. N and U can be called semi-consonants, but here they're going to call them syllabic consonants. So are we okay on vocoids? Is everything clear? Yes or no? Yes. All right. How about if we just finish up the page? Um, here we are concerned with semivowels, which are vocoids that function as the beginning or end of a syllable. So they are glides. Remember when we learned on glide and off glide last semester? Can you give an example of an on glide and a word that has an on glide? Everybody remember? Maybe if we start with off glide, it will be easier because most shuang mu yin, most diphthongs, they have their most prominent part at the beginning or at the end. At the beginning, and let's list some of the diphthongs that have their most prominent part at the beginning. I, a, ao, o, oi, for American, for English, not just American. All right. Mandarin has others, but we've got one other unusual diphthong in English that's different, and that's you. So for I, A, O, O, and OI, the beginning is the main vowel, and then the less prominent part is the glide. And if it comes at the end, we call it an off glide. Okay, we did that last semester. So in O, O is the main vowel, U at the end, it's short, it's the off glide. In U, it's just the opposite. The Y is the less prominent part. U, Y, U. U is the main vowel, and then Y is the on glide. Okay? Um, so here, we're concerned with semivowels, which are vocoids that function as the beginning or end of a syllable. The glides, bu guan sa on glide, hai sa off glide. Those are called semivowels. Okay? Glides, semivowels. When at the beginning of a syllable, a semivowel usually consists of a rapid glide, hua yin glide, from a high vowel position to that of the following vowel. The semivowels in English are y and w. So these are from a high vowel position going into the vowel, like you and wu, right? To woo somebody, uh, which are like non syllabic versions of the English high vowels e and u. So yi shang dui de na ge glide, so yi wu shang dui de glide, so bu. And in some languages like French, there are three high vowels. In English we have only two, but in French they also have u. And we have a corresponding semi-vowel for u, which is yu, yu. Yeah, push your tongue hard to make it even more extreme and you get yu, yi, yi. All right? Um, and that is written with an upside down lowercase h. And that's the third glide that they're talking about here. Um, earlier in this chapter, we noted that Japanese has a high unrounded vowel, u. Okay, u, u. It does not have spread lips like e, but lips that are fairly close together, compressed vertically, just as sang xia, ta with the corners neither drawn back as, as in a spread vowel nor pulled together as in a rounded vowel. So, in Japanese, u is somewhere in between. Um, there is a Japanese semi-vowel bearing the same relation to this vowel as w does to u or u in English. The symbol is an upside down lowercase m with a tail. So, a lowercase m, m is u, and if we want a semi-vowel for it, we add a tail to it. Okay? So, udon, u, u. If there's a glide in front of it, that's how we write it. 
And then um, we've got examples in table 9.3, and it's time for a break. All right, let's go back to Akan and ATR, because I found a better way to play the files. I should have found it earlier. This is playing them directly from a web page. And listen to the vowels in these two words. The first one is plus, the second minus ATR in Akan, OK? Sí. That's plus ATR. Here's minus. Sí. Sí. OK, you can hear? It just sounds like the vowel is higher or lower. But there's a difference of tension. Let's listen to another pair, plus. Boom. Boom. And minus. Oh. Oh. OK, you can hear it. That's right. But it's got ATR in addition. Here it is in the middle of a word. It's the center syllable. And then here is minus. OK. Here's another pair, plus. Minus. We're just hearing the difference in things like tongue height, but they're doing something else. Okay, and that one was minus. Okay, so that's making up the part that didn't work well earlier. <clears throat> We're talking about semivowels. Everybody understands now how semivowels work? Are semivowels vocoids? What kind of vocoids? Non-syllabic vocoids. Well, what are syllabic vocoids? Syllabic vocoids include vowels and and nasals, consonants that can be syllabic. Anything that can be syllabic and sounds like a vowel that doesn't have obstruction, um, that is pronounced without obstruction. N and U have obstruction in the mouth, but they're continuance and they're sonorants. OK, so let's go on. <clears throat> We're now on page 234. The gesture for a semivowel is like that for an approximant. So approximant buddha you semivowel. Semivowel is a category of approximants in that it can be considered to have a particular place of articulation like other consonants. So semivowel, ta shi yo gu ding de yi ge nega fa yin de wei zhi. We have already noted that ye is a palatal approximant and wu is a labial velar approximant. The semivowel yu yu is a labial palatal approximate. You better remember that one. OK, looks like another que test question. So even though I get really irritated when I hear stories about how bushi bind, they teach only the things that will go into the test. It was one of you who wrote, or maybe from another class, that the bushi bind are actually better than schools at teaching to pass the tests. One of you wrote that. The bushi bind, they're, they're their real purpose in life is to help people pass tests. And they're better at it than schools. Schools will teach you things that you don't necessarily need to know for the tests. OK? So, but I'm still telling you things to watch out for, just so you don't forget to memorize them. And then you get a bad grade because you weren't warned. That's no good. So the semivowel, the upside down, lowercase h, is a labial palatal approximant found in which language, for example? French. French. Y, y. We have not discussed this place of articulation before because approximants are almost the only sounds that are made in this region. So rounded lips plus palatal you, for approximants. This is about the only, this is the, this is the only approximant that we find there. So we didn't have a, a, a category called labial palatal. The semi-vowel upside down M with a tail is a velar approximant. So, udon. If it had it, if it had a, a, a glide at the beginning, udon, which I'm not sure it really has. When learning to produce the distinction between the French sounds w and y, note that the English w is between the two French sounds. It is not the same as the French w. It is, of course, also true that u in English is between the two French sounds u and u. So don't just make an assumption that if you see a vowel, learn a vowel in another language, it's just going to fit neatly into a Mandarin vowel category or an English vowel category, because they are often not that clear cut. So here it says that the English w is between what? 
French, what? English wo? English wo is between what? French, wo, and yu, yu, right? And then it says that the English u is between French, u, and u. All right, so just keep that in mind, yeah. Yeah, the e should be yu, exactly. I was wondering if it was la hua. <laughs> yeah. So the second line of the second paragraph, make it into yu, because they didn't mean that for French. Okay. I was amazed that I saw that even without my glasses. All right. Okay, got it? So the upside down M should be an upside down H with a tail. Okay, H has a tail. It's the M that has a tail. Okay. Um, so, as is often the case when a language does not have to distinguish between two possibilities, we often produce a sound that is what? If we don't have to distinguish, for example, between e and i in front of ng, like going, right? Going. Before ng, English does not distinguish between e and i. So, before ng, what do we find? We find something in between, that's what we've called velar raising, right? Because we don't have to distinguish between e and i in front of ng. Either one actually works fine. People do actually say going. Some dialects say going with i. And you can also make it very egoing, but that sounds a little weird. Usually it's between the two. And to produce the French sound w as in oui, oui, start from a high rounded vowel that is fully back like a cardinal u. Glide from this vowel very rapidly to the following vowel. The result will be similar but not identical to the English word we. Oui. English we oui is more front, the w, w is more back. So start from a back u, the cardinal u that we learned, u, u. Start there for your w, u, and then go very quickly to e, we, oui. we. Oui. So it's not English we. Oui. It sounds a lot more relaxed, right? So, we, oui, we. Oui. All right. Um, now try to say the French sound u, as in huit, eight. This time, start from the secondary cardinal vowel u, u, and glide to the next vowel, which is e. Huit, 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 Okay. So one is we, the other one is huit. Okay. It is also possible to consider the common forms of English r as in red as a semi-vowel in the same way that w may be said to be a non-syllabic counterpart of u. So r as in red may be said to be a non-syllabic version of the vowel in American fur. From a phonetic point of view regarding r in red as a semi-vowel may be a valid description, but from a phonological point of view it may not be appropriate in describing the sound patterns that occur in English. So, so here again we have a kind of conflict between phonetics and phonology. Calling er a non-syllabic semivowel, right? Calling it a semivowel is okay phonetically, but phonologically it may give us some problems. So he's saying we won't go that we won't go that way. All right, we can go to that place. Are we okay so far? Um, secondary articulatory gestures, these you really need to know. These you definitely need to know. Um, what is the difference between a primary and a secondary articulation? We learned it last semester. A primary articulation, for example, in sh is, it's an L, what? Palato-alveolar, palato-alveolar fricative, right? Shh, shh. But we're doing something else at the same time. We're also lip rounding, although it's not all the way to u, and that needs to be pointed out for Taiwan English, because a lot of people say shu, right? We don't want so much rounding, so we just call it labialization. Labialization, that means people won't misunderstand and think, go, think it goes all the way to the tight lip rounding of u. So if, which one is the primary? Articulation? 
Right. However, we've also got the other one. We're going to call that secondary because because it's in the third line of the paragraph. There is a lesser degree of closure. All right. So 距离远一点，那就是 secondary. That's all. And we had that last semester. Palatalization is the addition of a high front tongue gesture. Like that in E to another gesture. Russian and other Slavic languages have a series of palatalized consonants that con、uh, contrast with their non-palatalized counterparts. Palatalization can be symbolized by a very tiny raised letter Y after a symbol. Russian words illustrating palatalized sounds are given in Table 9.4, and I think we've got that on the CD. Let's try. All right, and they've got the first one is non-palatalized. Everybody listening? Do you have a question? No one, Tima. The first one is non-palatalized. The second one is palatalized. Listen to the differences. Here's non-palatalized. Forma. Forma. It's kind of loud. Let's try the second one. Everybody, please be quiet. Palatalized. Fiamma, fiamma, fiamma. The y is very clear, right? And the second one, non-palatalized, but there is palatalization actually at the at the end. Wait, 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 which means to be, and that's probably the only difficult vowel in Russian. If you want to learn Russian, wait, wait. I think I do it okay because I had a Russian classmate in Georgia, and she practiced with me until she said, "You got it." So maybe it's okay. Let's listen to the palatalized version, which means to weave. Oh no, the first one wasn't that. It was to howl, not to be. Okay. The second one is to weave. Weed, weed, weed. It's harder to hear because it's e, and e is the vowel counterpart of y. So it's listen again. This is a central e. Wait, wait, wait. And the second one is a regular e, and we've got palatal. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. There's a y there. Okay, the next one. Sok, sok. Which is juice, and the next one is he lashed. Sok. Sio, sio. You can hear the sio very clearly. To lash means to、um, punish somebody with like a rope, a bunch of ropes. To lash, to whip. 对，鞭挞 Zo, zo. And zo, zo, zo. Okay, that's all really clear, right? Palatalization. We've already covered that. Um, the terms palatalization and palatalized are sometimes used in a slightly different way from the way in which we have been using them so far. Instead of describing a secondary gesture, these terms may describe a process in which the primary gesture is changed so that it becomes more palatal. So, instead of adding a separate gesture, for example, with sh, we've added something that's not connected to the tongue; it's the lips, right? We may also use it in the sense that we're going to make the primary vowel or the primary gesture more palatalized. We call that palatalization. Okay.、Mm. Thus, sounds are said to be palatalized if the point of articulation moves toward the palatal re region in some particular circumstance. For example, the English k and key may be said to be palatalized compared to what? Car. So car is just an ordinary k, a velar k. But for key, we can say it's palatalized because it's moving towards the palatal region. But we don't usually call it that because it's just allophonic. It's just a k with an e, and your tongue moves to the place where we make an e. So we don't usually call it palatalized. But he's saying you could. Similarly, palatalization is said to occur when the alveolar fricative z in is. Becomes a palatal alveolar fricative, as in is she. We call that palatalization, and you'll find that in ESL books and in phonology books. So palatalization—they're talking about things like is she or don't you.
or did you? All of that is are examples of palatalization, okay? And it also becomes what? In the case of did you and don't you, it's also, in addition to palatalization, it's also affrication. Affrication. Anyway, but I said stop. Did you? It becomes an affricate. Did you? So it negates affrication in that case. For is she, it's not. Is she is still just a fricative. Um, a further extension of the term palatalization occurs in discussions of historical sound change in Old English. The word for chin was pronounced with the velar stop k at the beginning in German. Anybody know the word for chin in German? Kin. <laughs> so, yeah, they have the same origin. In English, it also originally had a k sound, but over time it became palatalized to ch, so the English became chin. That's a historical process. And we have it all over the place with Mandarin because, for example, ji in Minayu is ge or gui, whatever you like. Okay? G in Middle Chinese became ji in Mandarin. So, Minayu, palatalization, the lizi. Or, qi ta de qi, qi guai de qi is more common. Gi, yeah, gi ta and gi guai, gi. It's gi and we have qi in Mandarin. So, that's also palatalization. Then we have velarization, the next secondary articulation we're going to talk about. It involves raising the back of the tongue. It can be considered as the addition of an oo-like tongue position, but without the addition of the lip rounding that also occurs in oo. So if we add oo, then we're velarizing it. We don't add the lip rounding. That's, we don't want that part of the oo. And we've already noted examples of that, especially with the L. Dark L is a velarized L. So look, but pull, ooh, ooh. We've got a lot of tightness in the back of the tongue. It's getting close to the soft palate. That's velarization. And we write it with a tilde in the middle of the symbol. So tilde has lots of different meanings we mentioned before. Above a sound, it means nasalization in the middle. Velarization and underneath. Creaky voice laryngealization. As an ex exercise so that you can appreciate how it is possible to add vowel-like articulations to consonants, try saying each of the vowels, but with the tip of your tongue on the alveolar ridge. The first of these sounds is, of course, a palatalized sound, very similar to, to what? Yeah, all right. So we're going to put, we're going to go through the vowels, but the tip of your tongue will be on your alveolar ridge. So for E, you'll say li, li, and that will be quite palatalized. And then go on through the series. Li, le, okay, li, le, le, la, u, o, o, u, u. All right. The last of the series is one form of velarized L. So if you go... Uh, say the oo again with the tip of your tongue on your alveolar ridge. So, oo, oo. That's one kind of a velarized L, but it's got lip rounding. Usually we don't have lip rounding. Make sure you can say each of these sounds before and after different vowels. Now compare palatalized and velarized versions of other sounds and syllables such as, as na and, all right, it's nya and na, na, na. So we can velarize n as well, n, n. And now it's sounding Russian again. My ears immediately tell me Russian. And it, so that's velarization, n, n. They also have that. All right, and simply n with a superimposed monosyllabic u glide. Um, pharyngealization is the superimposition <coughs> of a narrowing of the pharynx. So pharyngealization, since cardinal vowel 5, a ah, has been defined as the lowest, most back vowel position without producing pharyngeal friction. Pharyngealization may be considered as the superimposition of this vowel quality. So let's make a very, very low, very, very back A. Ah, everybody? Ah, ah, ah. So if we put this, superimpose this quality on another sound, that is called pharyngealization. One IPA 
diacritic for symbolizing pharyngealization is? Again, it's the same as for velarization. We don't really distinguish. They're both going way back. If you have to distinguish between the two, then we will use a what? Small, raised, what do we call that? Gamma. That's a gamma. That's a gamma, right? And then um, for, the, for the pharyngealized alveolar nasal, we could use a, how can we describe that symbol? Backwards? With no? Dot. Okay. We can use that if we really need to mark that something's pharyngealized and not uh, velarized. The small gamma, the small raised gamma, is quite common. We actually use that one a lot. The, the, the small raised pharyngeal symbol I see less often, but there are languages where you probably need that, so it's good to know. Mm. Marking velarization and pharyngealization in this way is also preferable when the use of the tilde diacritic causes, creates a symbol that's hard to decipher. So if we're writing marks on top of symbols that makes it sort of moho buching, then we can use this method. It's clearer. There's very little difference between velarized and pharyngealized sounds, and no language distinguishes between the two possibilities. In Arabic, there's a series of consonants that Arabic scholars call emphatic consonants. That's worth remembering, because I've looked at some introductions to Arabic, and they use this term. So if you see the term emphatic consonants with Arabic, you know what they're talking about. Some of them are velarized, and some are pharyngealized. So emphatic consonants, they're either velarized or pharyngealized. All of them can be symbolized with the IPA diacritic, tilde. Arabic scholars often use a subscript dot, and I have seen that in books on Arabic. Nishamin jaga dot. That means it's an emphatic consonant. Add velarization, pharyngealization. You may need that. I mean, Arabic is one of the huge, huge major languages of the world. Arabic may be a language that you end up learning for some reason. Either you travel to the Middle East, you may go work there. Um, Arabic is, is a major language that it's, it's worth knowing something about. Yeah? Uh, I usually see the Arabic uh, alphabets or words with dots. Yeah. Is, is it a, a symbol or is it different? Oh, no. In the Arabic alphabet itself, they have different meanings for the dots. Each dot has a different meaning. You have to go through. If you just look on the, online, there are a lot of places where you can see. But the dots will have different meanings. It's not this. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is some similarity in quality between retroflex stops and velarized or pharyngealized stops because in all these sounds, the front of the tongue is somewhat hollowed. Okay. Um, we're talking about like uh, velarized or pharyngealized stops. So that would be like uh, 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 down there. It's something like retroflex, er, because in both cases, we are hollowing the tongue. Um, label it, labialization is the last one, last of the secondary articulations that they're going to introduce. It's the addition of lip rounding, but remember that sometimes it is not as tight as for a U or an U sound. And other, it differs from other secondary articulations because you can combine labialization with any of the others. So no. Labialization. Obviously, palatalization, velarization, and pharyngealization involve different tongue shapes that cannot occur simultaneously. So for the other ones we've been discussing so far, you have to pick one of them. You can't do them at the same time. Palatalization, velarization, pharyngealization because your tongue has to be in different parts of the vocal tract to produce each one. But nearly all kinds of consonants can have added lip rounding. Ji hu reng he your consonant ke jia sang lip rounding. Including those that already have one of the other secondary articulations, in a sense, even sounds in which the primary articulators are the lips, for example, p, b, m, can be said to be labialized if they are made with added rounding and protrusion of the lips. So everybody make a p sound. Puh. Now add lip rounding. Puh. Puh. 
peau. If you add more lip rounding, make it tighter, then you've added labialization to a bilabial. You can do that. B, m, all right, you can do that. Because labialization is often accompanied by raising the back of the tongue, it is symbolized by a raised, what symbol? A tiny W, and that's easy to remember. So labial velar, w. In a more precise system, this might be taken to indicate a secondary articulation that we could call labiovelarization. If we were being really, really really picky, putting that little w would add a w sound, labiovelarization. But we usually do not distinguish. Are we okay on that? Yeah. In some languages, for instance, Tui and other Akan languages spoken in Ghana, labialization co-occurs with palatalization, as palatalization is equivalent to the superimposition of a gesture similar to that in E. Labialization plus palatalization is equivalent to the superimposition of a rounded E, that is U, right? As we have seen, the corresponding semivowel is U. Yeah. Upside down H. Accordingly, these secondary articulations may be symbolized by a raised yeah. upside down H. Then we can, for example, yeah. Yeah. we can put that little H there if we want to make sure that we're paying attention to that um, semi vowel. Um, recall the pronunciation of Y yeah in French words such as yeah. then try to pronounce the name of one of the dialects of Akan. All right, Tui we've been saying, but actually it looks like it should be Tui. 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 Uh -huh. Very good. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Say, uh, table 9.5 summarizes the secondary gestures we have been discussing. As in some of the previous summary tables, the terms in 9.5 are not all mutually exclusive, which means some can be combined with each other, but some exclude each other. Some you can only do one, you can't do the others. A sound may or may not have a secondary articulation, such as, let's say them, palatalization, velarization, or pharyngealization. It may or may not be labialized, that's adding more, stronger um, muscle, muscle work to the lips, making a really tight ooh sound. And it may or may not be nasalized. To demonstrate this for yourself, this one's kind of fun. Try to make we're going to make an L now, but what kind of an L? It's voice, number one. It's alveolar, number two. And it's lateral, lateral number three. Okay, that's just a normal, clear L. Ooh. But now let's try making it velar, velarized. Ooh. Ooh. But keep it alveolar. Make sure your tongue tip stays there on the alveolar ridge. All right, now besides velarized, make it also label, labialized. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Now nasalize it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm. <laughs> Sounds like you've got something stuck in your mouth. <laughs> and you don't want to chew and swallow it and you can't spit it out. <laughs> All right. And there are the exercises which we are going to skip. Does that feel kind of good? Well, you have to pay for everything that you skip. <laughs> but have a look at them. Please read the exercises. Do that much. Read over the exercises. Write it down, assignment, read the exercises. Read them through, make sure you understand figure 9.14. Performance exercises, we sort of did in class. I don't want to take more time on that. So, finish chapter 9. We're starting on 10. We're starting on 10, we will finish it next Monday. And I think that will be just about right. Now, admittedly, it was rushed, but we still will have finished the book as promised. I don't know if I actually promised. I said maybe we would. <laughs> But we will finish. And chapter 11, does anybody have any questions on chapter 11? As I said, I'm not going to test you too much on chapter 11. Historically, I never have. But please read it through. Make sure you understand it. Any questions on 11? All right, we're going to start with 10, unless anybody has anything you want to ask. You are responsible for reading each chapter carefully yourself, OK? We're just running over it fast, but I think we've covered it more or less uh, 
enough, I think, for the test for what you need to know from this book. But you need to read it over, make sure you've got everything. 10 is about syllables and suprasegmental features. OK, yeah, if you need to blow your nose, just stop. We'll stop a minute, no problem. So 10 is about, again, syllables, syllables and, and features. Good. Now, we mentioned last semester that this is traditionally one of the weaker parts of phonetics. People are paying a lot more attention to it now than they did, say, 30, 40 years ago. But we still have not figured everything out. It's getting a lot better now. And when I hear people say that now, people, people being actually my son's fiance, she said now that speech recognition for Mandarin is now so good. It's gotten really good. Not for Siri. She was talking about an application for Android where you can just give commands to your phone, tell it what to do. You don't have to pick it up and then play around with, a, with, with a, touching the right, right part of the screen. You can just give it an order. Now, the fact that it's so good, I didn't get the details, but I'm guessing it's because there are a limited number of commands. I believe that's why. You can tell your phone what to do, like call somebody, or look up a phone number, or open up a certain program. It understands that. Wendy? I, I, I use iPhone, and last week I I open, I open Siri and I use it to chat with my friends. This, they have a, an FB message chat room. Mm -hmm. This is how I go FB message. And I just speak Facebook. It, uh, uh -huh. It's Chinese and it can like, show the sentence out. So you read what you want to say into it and it types it out in Chinese and it's pretty accurate? There you go. No, we didn't have to write Oh, there we go. That's what my future daughter-in-law was telling me. She says the accuracy now has gotten really good for Mandarin. That's impressive. When you consider how many different styles of speaking Mandarin there are, think of somebody who's very old. They, they might not use Siri, I have to admit, but has a very strong Taiwanese accent or has a very strong teenager accent or speaks, you know, like a, a very, very standard Peking style kind of accent, if it can handle all of that, that's really amazing. Taiwan Guoyu, yeah, that's probably the, the default because that's, well, depends on what you mean by Taiwan Guoyu. Somebody told me that you can distinguish Taiwan Guoyu from Taiwan de Guoyu. We speak Taiwan de Guoyu. We don't speak Taiwan Guoyu so much, right? Okay, that's kind of stigmatized. <laughs> But if, if a speech recognition program can handle all that, that represents a huge, huge advance from what we had before. So in order to get that lihai, they had to understand this part of speech recognition, of language, human language, much better. Okay, part of it is segments, it's vowels and consonants, but a lot of it is timing and other features, length, all kinds of things. So here we're going to be talking about suprasegmentals. First of all, can we define syllables? We talked about this last semester. There are many different, there have, people have made many, many different attempts to define the syllable. None of them is really satisfactory. I gave you my own personal one, which is, it's just a working definition. It's not a really, it's not a really, really, um, um, rigorous one. What did I give you last semester? Anybody remember? Anybody remember? A syllable is the subjective sense of one beat. That's the best I can do for syllable. And that can be flexible enough to adapt to people who have different ideas of what ipai is. So for example, bush to me is ipai, but to a speaker of Belakula, bush is two. They consider it two syllables. So depending on what you consider to be one beat, this definition can be flexible enough to adapt to those different perceptions of what a syllable is. That's the best I can do. I think that is the best I've been able to find. You can find all kinds of other, prop, other proposals for defining a syllable, but all of them have exceptions because different languages do things in different ways. 
but this one adapts to your subjective feeling, what a beat is. All right, so throughout this book, there have been references to the notion syllable, but this term has never been defined. The reason for this is simple. There is no agreed phonetic de definition of a syllable. If you want to define it phonetically, that means we have to be very yenji and very rigorous. We haven't been able to do it so far because you call this a syllable and I say it's not a syllable. How can we define something when people disagree like that? It just, you can't come up with something rigorous in that situation. So you have to introduce an element of subjectivity. What? Potato, yeah, okay. But it's even more serious than that. At least the, the, the number of syllables is the same. Potato, potato. They both have three syllables. I mean, there's a new pattern. That's right. That's true. Oh, you heard it. That means you stored an echo, doesn't it? You had an audio file that played. That's good. That's exactly what should be happening for all of you. Okay, that's great. Um, <clears throat> so, we can't agree on a definition of a syllable. And it's impossible because basically, we could say it's subjective, it's not objective. If it's subjective, you cannot have a rigorous definition, except to say that in your subjective estimation, you hear a beat. So this chapter will discuss some of the theories that have been advanced and show why they are not entirely adequate. We already know all of the theories are going to lose. None of them is going to win. We will also consider suprasegmental features, those aspects of speech that involve more than what? Just consonants and vowels. Those are suprasegmentals. So segments are consonants and vowels in tuan. Suprasegmentals are aspects of the speech signal beyond that, like length and stress and so forth. The principal suprasegmental features are? Go. Watch out length. Put a K in there, length. All right, not everybody does it. Some say length. It's true. I don't like it, though. <laughs> length. And tone, watch your O, oh, it's not tone. Everyone, tone. tone. You have to make an effort. Everybody, tone. tone. Intonation. You can be lazy on the tone and intonation. That's a schwa. These features are independent of the categories required for describing segmental features, vowels, and consonants. So, you can describe these super segmentals, the in tuan, the shihou. Which involve airstream mechanisms, states of the glottis, primary and secondary articulations, and form and frequencies. Okay, um, those are the things that will be involved in suprasegmentals. Uh, in syllables, it says that the fact that they're important units of uh, uh, their important units of phonetics or of speech is illustrated by the history of writing. Many writing systems have approximately one syllable, uh, sorry, one symbol for each syllable. And when I make a mistake on symbol, I usually say syllable. Just one symbol for the, one syllable for the syllable. I've done it many times. In previous videos, I've had to edit it out because edit it out. Can you say that? Edit it out. Edit it out. Edit it out. It's not even easy for a native speaker. Because often when I want to say symbol, I will say syllable. Because I say syllable more often than symbol. And they're very similar. Uh, I didn't say they're very similar. All right. So <laughs> one symbol for each syllable. His point is that historically, long before we had the alphabet, we had a different kind of writing system, which was called a, you had this in vowels and consonants. What do we call a writing system that represents sim the symbols, huh? <laughs> syllables rather than segments. No? Has four syllables. This is going to be a tongue twister. I'm going to have to keep on thinking before I say symbol or syllable. Symbol, syllable, symbol, syllable. OK. What do we call it if the writing system represents individual syllables rather than segments? Stress is on the first syllable. Syllabary. Syllabary. It's called a syllabary. That's what we use for the Japanese writing system. It's a syllabary. And remember I asked you the question last semester about Korean? And then we all decided Korean, is it a syllabary or an alphabet? It's definitely an alphabet. So Korean is an alphabet. 
Japanese uses a syllabary. All right. Um, so the earliest writing that we had, not counting the Xiangxing Wen, so the hieroglyphs of Egypt, we had syllabic writing systems. And so um, we better go through the text. He says some interesting things. But only once in the history of humankind has anybody devised an alphabetic writing system in which syllables were systematically split into their components. He's saying that the alphabet was invented only once. And he thinks that's significant because a lot of people came up with syllabaries, but the alphabet was invented only once and then it spread. So that's why he thinks that the syllable is a very basic unit of language. His view is kind of controversial. A lot of people don't agree with him. I don't think I totally agree with him. But it's worth thinking about as a thought experiment. And that's where we're going to stop. I think we did very well. And Carol is still awake yes. in spite of everything. In spite of not sleeping much last night, and in spite of you guys not reading, having me just read instead, without glasses besides. I think I did OK reading without glasses, right? Oh, I was really worried about that. Um, I'm quite sure we will not have much problem finishing the chapter. So, so students, keep listening. Don't tune out yet. Um, if we finish early enough, I may start the presentation about formants in music. So we may do part of the web page about formants in music next Monday. I would have had Victor come then, except he is taking a Chinese class now. By the way, his Chinese is really good, I will tell you. He will probably present in Chinese. In fact, Victor and I speak in Chinese to each other. We don't speak English. Yeah. I write to him in English. He writes to me in French. We speak in Mandarin. <laughs> no, it works very well. His English doesn't need practice, but it's easier for me to write in English. He writes French. It's easier for him, and then he's trying to give me practice. But when we speak, we, we speak Mandarin. So, and he also speaks Swedish. He's, he's part Swedish. His mother is Swedish. So he's very good in four languages. And he studied a number of other ones he may tell you about. Anyway, so he's coming on Wednesday. That will be a short time before the final exam. Monday, we may rush through the chapter. Some of it is new. I want you to preview. If you preview, you'll save us a lot of time. We'll have more time for the web page, which is a lot of fun. And it's, it's worth it. So everybody, please finish chapter 10 yourself. Read through chapter 9. Read through chapter 10 yourself. We'll go through it quickly, and then we'll have time for the web page and music. That's basically the plan. Does anybody have any questions about the final exam? No. Not a single question. We're done for today. We'll see you next Monday. Have a very happy Duanwujie. <laughs>